Hello and welcome to the RCSI University of Medicine and Health Sciences. Uh, for this, the, the first of our My Health uh, series. This one we've called it Living with the New Normal. And we're going to be discussing the challenges to our health, particularly our mental health, of dealing uh, with COVID-19. I'm delighted this evening to be joined by uh, Professor Eva Doherty, who is a clinical psychologist and director of the Human Factors and Patient Safety Program here at the RCSI. Professor Jim Lucy, who is a graduate of RCSI, uh, is clinical professor of psychiatry at Trinity College in Dublin and a consultant psychiatrist at St. Patrick's University Hospital. And also by Dr. Trudy Meehan, a senior clinical psychologist and a lecturer here at the RCSI Center for Positive Psychology and Health. So we're living in complex times and the COVID pandemic is, has been a, an enormous challenge to our mental health. Uh, Jim, can I, can I start with you? We say we've never experienced anything like this before. In, from your, your experience and in your estimation, what are the biggest challenges to our, our well-being, to our mental health from, from this strange situation that we find ourselves in? Well, one of them, Kieran, is scale. This is uh, described as unprecedented. Of course, uh, historians will know that it's not unprecedented. But I think that it's more useful in the time we have to think the ways in which this particular uh, world event is different. Uh, and that helps us to understand why it's so difficult. Because this, I, I think it's reasonable to describe this as the beginning of the 21st century. It's a global event. Everybody is affected in some way. And it's a global event that is going to affect everybody's life and continue to do that in a new way, which isn't necessarily the case about every pandemic. Even some pandemics that had great lives lost weren't in a sense uh, millennial uh, and really transformational. So I think change is very difficult for us. And that's uh, a large amount of what we're talking about tonight. And do you have a, a sense you know, of people's experience of this and trying to cope? What are, what are the, big, the big factors that you see there in, I suppose in how we're we, trying to cope with this? We're all, we all are seeing things from our own lives, our family lives, our children's lives, and, 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 and these experiences are valid. I suppose to bring to the discussion, I'd also bring the experience of people with mental health difficulties and mental health problems. And certainly they would uh, have had an increase in those difficulties because of the... Uh, not just because of the uh, virus itself, but because of the lockdown. Obviously, there's a small number that may yet have difficulties directly as a result of the virus, and more data is coming out about the science of that is growing very rapidly. But day to day, people are having enormous difficulties. It's a bit like that economist who suggested that, you know, at a recession, the tide goes out and you discover who's got their kit on. Um, at this kind of time, the tide of general well being goes out and you discover how much stress that people are have been living with and coping with and now are not. How many people who were already finding it difficult to cope and are now find that difficulty even greater. And how many people who, for whom it's a completely unprecedented thing to feel this level of general disease, distress, unease and, and anxiety. And one last thing I think that illustrates that, at the moment in the country we're talking about, not the virus, we're talking about the confusion. Everybody's talking about confusion, looking for clarity. They want more clarity. No amount of leadership can give the clarity that's required because it's not clarity that's lacking. It's the ability to live with this uncertainty, with this huge tumult. And that can't be resolved by more information alone. Yes, and we might come back to that to think about the, the impact of this infodemic, the amount of information that we're all being, being subjected to. I think that's uh, right. We, we, we'll come back around to that. Uh, Eva, can I, can I turn to you? There's a great deal of change required now. We have to adapt. You know, what, are, what do you think are the challenges for us in adapting to the kinds of changes that we're, we're seeing? Well, of course, I, I think we tend to think that change is hard and, you know, there's, there's a science called change management. So there's people out there to help people manage change, usually in organisations. But, but change isn't always hard. You know, if you think of good changes, you know, like maybe marrying, you know, the love of your life is not hard. You know, moving into the house of your dreams, you know, going on a lovely holiday. You know, changes, some changes are welcomed and, and are not hard. I think what makes a change hard, uh, I mean, there's lots of things, but if I had to 
kind of come down on it on one side, I'd probably say it really depends on the meaning and, and what the change represents to you and what is the meaning. And that's going to be very different to every person. And probably I think what's in there, certainly what I found is that a big factor there is whether the change represents some kind of loss of autonomy, mm. you know, and loss of control. I think that's what makes things really hard. And um, and then, you know, be and then, you know, loss of autonomy, it's one of the six factors that we know causes burnout. So you know, it's a really important one. So, uh, yeah, that's what I, that's what so I come down to. So do you think to. a lot of us are feeling then that life isn't as predictable or as controllable as it's been and that we've lost our, our, our sense of being able to influence things? Is that, is that the core? Well, you see, of course, the illusion there is, is that, you know, we all like to think that things are predictable, whereas in truth, they're yes, not. Yes, uh, yes. Yeah. You know, you go down Grafton Street and ask people, you know, to make a prediction for, you know, the next six months and, you know, they're going to get it wrong. But we do like to think that things are, un that are predictable. So then when something like this happens, it's a real shock because it's like, oh my goodness, I didn't predict this and I don't, and I don't know what's going to happen next week. And you know, or you know, three months down the line or whatever it is. And so um, we're thrown by that because we, you know, we like to live in the illusion of predictability. Yeah, and I, it, it has struck me to, to wonder whether that will make people more aware of the huge climate change that's happening in the background mm -hmm. here, that we've seen that bad things can actually happen mm. and, and can happen at, at huge scale. Mm -hmm. are, are there, what kinds of differences are there in the ways in which we, we, we try to adapt to change? Do you see big differences in the ways that individuals tackle change or try to cope with change? Well, it's probably, it's, uh, yeah, I mean, the, that's right. And a huge amount of that is going to depend, I think, on, on people's experience. So, you know, if, if you're coming to this and you and change have kind of, has kind of been negotiated pretty positively through your life, you're probably going to cope with this one, all right. But if change for you means something threatening, difficult, you're not going to have a good feeling about this. And, and I think, you know, what's going to happen is there is that, you know, your sort of your stress part of your brain, your, your limbic system, that's going to get activated. That's going to be leading. And your brainy part of your brain, your cortex is not going to be as activated. And there's good research to show this. Um, so it's going to be harder for you to generate um, good coping strategies and to adapt to it. So I think it really depends on, you know, how sensitized you are and, 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 and how it affects you. So are you saying that we can get a little bit swamped with our emotions and it's hard to plan or it's hard to adapt or, co or to think about how we should cope? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. And, and, and in fact, for me, emotions are key here yes. because yeah. once you figure out what emotion you're experiencing and maybe it's the whole lot of them, then that starts giving you cues as to what is the meaning and how it is affecting you. So like when I ask people whether they think emotions are simple things or complicated things, they always tell me they're complicated, but actually they're not. You know, most of, a lot of emotional functioning is, our, is originating in the more kind of primitive centers mm. in our brain. There's only six basic ones. There's about 550 words in the English language to describe an emotion, but there's really only six basic ones. And each emotion tells us something very important about what's going on with us and what's happening. That, that that's a cue to, to what's yeah. actually happening. Excellent. We'll come back, maybe we'll come back around to that. Uh, Trudy, you're very interested in children and, and, and adolescents, uh, young people, and how they, they uh, cope in, in general. So for many people watching this, you know, who have children, helping them to cope and to deal with what's going on is a huge challenge. Uh, kids have gone back to school, their lives have been completely disrupted. Wh what are the, the specific psychological challenges that you think that children and, and young people, and maybe there are two different questions, they're face in, in dealing with COVID? Yeah, I think, yeah, and I appreciate you differentiating between children and young people. Essentially, all of their brains are still under construction but at different stages. So younger children have more construction and need more help from us. And um, with the brain air part of the brain, as Eva was saying, um, Professor Dan Siegel talks about the, the downstairs brain, the amygdala and the limbic system and the upstairs brain, mm -hmm. which is the brain air part of the brain, the cortex. And that's the planning and logic and thinking through things. So younger children need more help. And as teenagers develop and there's they're, that's still under construction. And for many adults, it's still under construction as well. We're still making the links. 
Um, so it changes depending on the age of the child and the challenges are different and the amount of support they need from us is different. The nice thing about children and young people is that we can essentially fake that predictability because they look to us for the first kind of clues and signs. Is this safe? What's the situation in the future? What are you thinking about the future? So we can give them a sense of security and safety that perhaps as adults we can't. So it's really important and it's, it's one of the benefits of being a child and a young person at the moment. So in a sense, this is harder on parents and caregivers because we are given a double burden at the moment. We have to manage our own anxiety, but then we have to help our children and young people manage theirs. So, so how should parents then, then talk to their children about this? How much should they talk? What kinds of information? How, how should they, maybe how should they communicate is a better term. How should they talk? Because it's a two-way process. Yeah, I really like that you talk about communication rather than just talking to yeah. or talking at. We're very good at talking at our kids and young people. Um, but I think it's important to listen to them at the moment and ask them questions and especially ask them if they have any questions. You'll often be really surprised. We tend not to say to our children and young people, do you have any questions? Um, usually because we're too busy or we just don't think about it, it doesn't come to mind. Um, but it can be a really nice and interesting prompt for them just to say, have you any questions about what's going on? So the first thing would be listening. Mm -hmm. But there's a particular way to listen and I call it, and it's a psychological version, and it might be a bit fluffy, but I call it listening with your heart ears. So listening with your heart and listening to their heart and their reactions. And Dan Siegel would call this attunement. So you're tuning into their emotional life and you're listening with your heart and your emotional being. And it's really important because for all of us, you cannot calm that, that brain down, that downstairs brain. It's firing, it's feeling anxious, and it's firing, it's firing. You have to calm that down before you can talk to the upstairs brain. So we have to listen to how our young people and children are feeling. And sometimes that's really hard. I don't want to hear when my five-year-old is distressed. It makes me feel distressed. So we have to make space to listen. We have to hold that distress and not get distressed ourselves. Breathe, be calm, and then respond with some logic and some empathy and compassion. So something like, I hear that that's making you feel really scared. Where did you hear that information? And try and stay calm. It's really easy, with, especially with teenagers, with so much misinformation out there at the moment, to just lose it and say, where did you hear this rubbish? Yes, yes. You know, and it's not helpful. It, it just connects your amygdala with their amygdala and everybody's, you know, heightened. So it's really important to try and stay calm and it's hard. So it's listening, listening with your heart, staying calm, then redirecting them to trusted sources of information calmly. Yeah. It's easier with teenagers in terms of we, they don't want us to tell them anyway. Um, so redirecting them to sources. Young people and young adults prefer to do their own research. They also prefer to hear from their peers, not from adults. So something like spunout.ie, which is a youth information website with information made by young people for young people, is something we can refer young people to. With younger children, it's important to be really concrete, short and specific, and to check in with understanding. Yeah. Um, my five-year-old reminded me that she doesn't understand what two metres is. And it was really enlightening. I forgot that that's a basic thing that a five-year-old might not know. So it's important to check in. Yeah. And then I, I suppose because it's continuous, I mean, you're trying to cope all the time. You know, it's important for parents not to beat themselves up. You know, that is kind of, you know, this is a, this is a marathon really and the, the pressures are, are chronic rather than things that will, you know, just disappear overnight. That's the thing. And I think as parents and caregivers, we have to understand that we will definitely fail. We will make mistakes, we will get over emotional, we'll be exhausted, we'll be frustrated and overwhelmed. And that's okay. And it's actually sometimes helpful for our young people. The worst thing you can be is perfect. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we don't want our young people to think that they can't feel, that they can't break down, that they can't be sad. We yeah. want them to know that that's okay. 
I'm delighted to hear you say the worst thing can be is perfect. <laughs> I never, I never achieved it. <laughs> Thanks, to you. Uh, Can I, can I just come back then around and and open this up a little bit? One of the things that I, I think is 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 happening for lots of people is that they're suffering loss, and there yeah. there are different kinds of losses. It's not just the loss of family or death, you know, losses of future. Oh, Jim, what would you, what, what's your sense I, I about that? I think that's a really good point in terms of the distress <laughs> for us at this time, and I. I I, I was interested in what Eva was saying about the meanings of things mm -hmm. and the, the loss maybe of autonomy. And, and that's really true. The loss of uh, a whole range of things, often very personal and sometimes quite surprising. I think it calls to question even the title of the talk tonight, Living with a New Normal. Mm. Well, yes, it's, we're living with the new, but it definitely isn't normal, isn't it? We've lost normal, collectively. We yes. could break it all down. Yes. And I think there's a great deal of grief out there about that. Equally, there are lots of people, um, maybe not a majority, uh, who are having a good new normal. Mm. You know, there are aspects to this that are working for them. But collectively, we feel it's not normal. And that is, without a doubt, a loss, you mm. know. A, lo a loss for lots of people. Now, add to that the actual practical losses and not being able to bury our dead the way we could and not to be able to be with our families and not to be able to, you know, these are huge practical things. In a sense, I think most of us, I mean, what's it, the, the poet said, you know, we live lives of quiet desperation. Mm -hmm. Most of us are waiting for that weekend where, where we can get to do something that, you know, our thing to let steam off. And we've had months and months of not being able to do that. Uh, it's very much, I think, constrained in the debate in Ireland because we tend to get Ibeck and a sense of the, 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 the drinks industry and whatever, as though that was, but in a way that's a talisman or a, 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 a meter for the sense that we all have lost mm. of our ability to, to be recreational. Mm, mm. And it's so important for us to get that time out, to relax, to step back, to, to laugh. Um, Lots of losses. For people. Yeah, and uh, Eva, would you say, I mean, for young people, I mean, we've just seen the leaving cert, you know, and the difficulties around that. Do you think that young people are experiencing a sense of loss about predictable futures and so on? Is that important in terms of the, the stresses that they're trying to cope with? Totally. I mean, young people do not need unpredictability. I mean, they just don't. And, you know, because they're so much is new for them anyway. And, you know, and they don't need things to be changing as rapidly as it's currently happening. And I think. I was listening to you there, Trudy. I, th I think as well the biggest, genuinely, really hard thing for them is they're not getting to be with their peers. Mm -hmm. And like that is as necessary for them as water for a plant. You know, like they, it's not like they need their peers, you know, for a bit of fun. They actually need it to develop. Yes. You know, it's like it's the way they figure out their identity. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's because they have to compare themselves. I mean, when you see young teenagers, I always smile, you know, when they're young, like say 12, 13, they always dress the exact same. So they have the same t-shirts, the same shoes, the same hair. And so they, you know, that's part of their identity. And then as they start to differentiate and they go along, you know, they start to find their own way and they, and so, so they start kind of tweaking it a bit. And finally, when, you know, when they're adults, you know, they can be quite different. So they're being robbed of all that and they're having, and they're having to do it on social media. And that's fraught with some snags as well. Um, and uh, so I think it's really hard for them. Yeah, I agree. And that's a generation that, you know, are, are asked to show so social solidarity by, you know, change of behavior because of older people who are, you know, at greater risk of serious complications. So you, what, what would your, t your take on that be in terms of y y young people and the losses that they're experiencing? Yeah, they're real. And I think we really need to acknowledge that and, and, and not fob them off. Um, and, and it's that relative de deprivation idea from psychology that they, they had a reasonable expectation to expect that their life would go a specific way, to expect that their university experience would be X, Y, or Z. It was reasonable to expect that and it's been taken away from them. Yes. So people sometimes think you can't grieve something unless you've actually lost it. But you can grieve an expectation or a dream. And we see that all the time. People who experience infertility can grieve the loss of the child they hoped for. Yes. Yes. And it's the same with this group of young people. They're grieving the loss of a dream and a future they hoped and reasonably expected to have yeah. that was taken away from them yeah. suddenly. Yeah. So it's very real. Yeah. And we really need to acknowledge that. Yeah. 
and help them start to look for ways to build a different future. But you can't build forward without grieving and acknowledging how they're feeling. So I think we, we're, what I'm hearing you all saying is there's a process, there is a grieving process here that is Im important. Mm -hmm. do, do you think, again, again a question for everybody, uh, I, I have a sense that we're dealing with a tsunami of information. You know, every time you turn on the radio, every time you're on television, you pick up the news, we're just getting this this huge tirade of information. Now, a certain amount of information is, is fine. What are the consequences for us about being overly engaged in this sort of infodemic? The consequences are very great. Yeah. And I, 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 do, I do come back to this idea that um, people are looking now for more and more clarity, and they're talking about confusion. And I think it is a, it is a, uh, a handlebar for distress. But it's actually one that tells us something about the nature of that distress. People are overloaded. Quite genuinely, they don't know which way to turn. Yes. And the ways they're being asked to turn are not necessarily attractive. None of us like to cleave to, to uh, information that's unpleasant or unhel uh, you know, uh, doesn't help us sleep at night. I, I think the, the way in which the overload I I has, is happening now is something that's probably um, ahead of the leadership and ahead of us all. Because just as I was saying that, in my view, this is the first event of the 21st century, it's the first event of this kind to happen in the new media age, in the new... So everybody has these sources of information constantly. And that might have been something we would have worked out in time, had time been allowed to us. But when some global event happens like this, it's almost a, a source of new urgency, of new attention, and I think of new uh, anxiety, mm. uh, because it's always on, mm. it's always on. Breaking news is not something that any of us need, <laughs> but we're getting it all the time. So, and, and I, I think the advice is probably to kind of restrict the amount of information you're exposing yourself to. Uh, does th this notion of I, that? I think you do, I think you have, uh, to, yeah. you have to pull back. Yeah, I, um, I'm gonna say, judge it depending on, on yourself and look to your emotional responses as a guide. You know, if, if if you're reading stuff, I mean, first of all, you have to figure out that what you're reading is coming from good sources. So I think that's pretty critical. But let's just take that as, as read. Um, um, so if, if information, if you like, is making you angry, if it's making you fearful, if it's making you upset and sad, if it's making you disgusted, um, you know, if it's shocking you all the time, then it's probably time to take a bit of a stock take on that and say, is this really good for me? It's triggering these negative emotions. It's threatening my needs in some way, because that's essentially what our emotions are really all about. Um, and maybe I, maybe I need to just curtail it, or maybe actually it's good for me. Maybe I'm the kind of person who, if I don't know what's happening every five minutes every day, I worry anyway. You know what I mean? So I would nearly say, just look to see how it's affecting you. And if it's not affecting you, happy days. But if it is, think about that and, and, you know, and think about how it makes you feel. Yeah. Could, could we continue on then uh, just to start, you know, uh, as we're, we're coming to the, 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 the third section of, of, of tonight's uh, session, you know, the, the practical kinds of strategies that people can use. You know, w one of the questions uh, really that I, I think it'd be, I'd be interested in hearing your views on is, is, is this idea of change and then how, how we should cope with change. What are the main strategies that we should be using in, in terms of coping effectively with the kind of changes we're dealing with? Okay. Okay, so let's go back to the idea that it has to do with meaning. So that means it's about analysing that and figuring out what is the meaning that I'm putting on this? What, what is the kind of inner conversation going on in my head? Is it rational? Have I got evidence for it? If I don't, well then it's probably not very helpful yeah. if it's making me upset. I think as well, and I mean, that's essentially the basis of CBT, so cognitive behaviour therapy. It's all about looking at your thought processes and how they link in with your emotions but if but also i think we need to respect our emotional responses so if i'm angry that means it's threatening my needs in some way if i'm sad it means i'm suffering loss if i'm disgusted it means that my values are are under threat mm -hmm. um, if i'm if i'm fearful that means i'm predicting negatively in the future if i'm shocked that means i didn't anticipate you know and it's kind of 
got me unawares. So if, if you use your emotions to give you a clue mm -hmm. as, as to what the meaning is mm -hmm. and respect it and go, right, I'm really frustrated and angry now because, you know, I want to be able to do such and such or I need such and such or I haven't seen my boyfriend for six months, you know, because he lives in the UK or whatever. Um, you know, and, and so that need is being frustrated and, and respect that. So I, I would, so in terms of, and then I mean, in terms of managing the individual emotions, well obviously the obvious ones for, you know, fear and anxiety is not only looking at your thought processes, but also, you know, thinking about how it affects you physiologically. Yeah. You know, are you going around in a tight knot the whole time? In which case, what about mindfulness? What about breathing? What about relaxation? Excellent. You know, what and about our, yoga? Yeah. What about exercise? Yeah. You know, would they help? Yeah. And our uh, our last My Health uh, session was on mindfulness and meditation. Yeah. That's a good link. And people can find that on the, the RCSI uh, YouTube channel. Thanks for that. Trudy, people will be thinking, watch this, I can't do everything for my children or my child. You know, if, if, I, if they have to prioritize, wh what, what are the really the crucial uh, things that we need they need to think about yeah the the biggest thing and it, it, it's very small but it's very hard to do is to fill up their emotional piggy bank so it's basically giving our children small slivers of our full undivided attention mm -hmm. which is often really hard to do mm -hmm. and sometimes even even if you need to do it set a timer on your phone sit down with your child if it's a younger child and they want to play set it for five minutes if that's all you can manage set it for 10 minutes and give them that time that emotional contact will buy you many many hours of of calm connected happier children for teenagers it's the same the thing with teenagers is their emotional bids for connection are often really hard to see yes. and yeah. it can be something like screaming at you from the bottom of the stairs where where's my jeans where's my runners i can't yeah. find anything yeah. And they just want a kind response right. rather than a shout back down the stairs. That might be to come out of the room and look down and make eye contact with them. But look for emotional bids from your children and young people and respond and make those connections with them. It's tiny, but it's very hard to do at times. And is the idea you're building up credit in that emotional bank account or whatever? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So you can draw on that when it's necessary and things. You like can that. draw on that. It, it gives them time to decompress. They feel safe. They're more likely to be able to release their emotions and communicate with you. The older children are more likely to feel safe and secure and that you're responsive and that you are there. Most teenagers are unlikely to talk to you, but they need to know that they can. Yes. It's more just the knowing that they can, the door, even if they never the do it. Open, yeah. Yeah. And Jim, can I come to you on that? So, you know, when people are trying to, to cope, from, from your experience, what, what are the, what's the really most important? I kind think of? The, the, the synthesis of these things, uh, the mindfulness, the uh, meaningfulness, uh, the emotional uh, investment, uh, the synthesis of it comes down, though, to uh, remaining... Um, committed to wellness, to, to being in some way whole and well ourselves, if we can. And we've very few handles on that, but broadly, broad strokes, trying to get some exercise, trying to s make time to, to maybe eat uh, reasonably, you know, sh uh, avoiding the, the pressure to be rushing the whole time, uh, where many of us talking about, you know, um, parenting uh, and, and working and how that's changed. And one of my friends, Coleman Nocturne says that it's not actually, you know, working at home. It, it's parenting at work, and so I think there's a there's a balance. The key thing, the one thing I would recommend people to do, because it's something that you can put effort into and attention to, is to value the uh, the, 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 the uh, principle of sleep. Mm -hmm. To s to see that actually this is something I can manage. I can make time. If I'm not going to sleep, I could decide to change that. I like to tell people to say, go to bed 10 d minutes earlier each night of a week, and at the end of the week, they'll have gained an hour's sleep, a thing that they wouldn't have imagined of doing. Uh, we know that the people will tell you, I know all about sleep hygiene, but when you actually inquire, they don't give, they don't give what, what Foster says about sleep, you know, that it's a god and you should go and worship it. Mm. So I really think the dividends from that extend into this whole sense of looking after your own wellness because we're getting through this it is new 
It is lasting, but it doesn't need to be a terrible normal, even if it's a changed one. It's one we can actually live and be well and happy in, but differently. I think that's very important, Jim, drawing that linkage between our mental health and our physical health. They're yes, not separate. That's, that's they're the not point. separate. That's the point. We've tended to kind of construct that to some <coughs> extent as if they're separate, but of course they're not separate. They're not yeah. separate. Yeah. And, and in fact, one attends to the other. Your sleep is one real good way of en uh, uh, enhancing your, your, your mind and, and, and your body, and, and indeed get making time just simply to be mindful and restful, to, to, to pause is a real way of preparing for sleep. Uh, these, things, these things are all linked. And not forgetting diet, if I can interject, because mm -hmm. I know your colleague Ted Dynan is part of a, um, a research group that have you know, just made incredible discoveries about the link between diet and mental well-being. And, uh, you know, and that's something that we thought was probably important, but now we have the actual evidence. And it operates, it's incredibly complicated, but it operates through the vagus nerve, if I'm right. Yes. I, I into I, to the brain. I think there's real hope there that yeah. we're, we're, again, synthesizing the mind-body divide, and it, which is one of the great, you know, the great errors was, I think, therefore I am. Absolutely. In fact, I am, therefore I am, I think, yeah. is what would, would have been more helpful. And Ted's work and his group, the group in Cork, have really uh, uni unified the idea. Interestingly, the first um, antidepressants were antibiotics. Yep. Um, and in fact, the first action of those was on gut microbiota, the, the actual the, 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 uh, biology of the gut. Turns out to be hugely um, powerful yeah. uh, in the way our brains work. So there's a whole way in which we realize the mind and the body it's are not divided. Yeah. And, and there's great optimism there. In fact, one of the reasons we're, we're, we're moving into the space in RCSI, lifestyle medicine, is because of the emergence of exactly these kinds of, mm. this kind of research, which shows us that we're, we're, we're whole we're systems, whole. and there's a great deal we ourselves as individuals can do to, mm. to improve it. Just, just wrapping up then, could, could I just go around, you know, all very experienced mental health professionals, what would be the one thing you, you, the one thing you'd say to people to sort of to do and to think about the one takeaway truly could I, could I start with you I think to remember that there is reason to be optimistic yes. yeah. and to remember that bad is stronger than good so bad experiences sit with us and they stay with us longer than good experiences do so we can be tricked into forgetting to be optimistic or believing that there's nothing to be optimistic about so I think we need to deliberately look for things to be optimistic about. Doing something like a gratitude journal yes, yes. seems like a simple thing, but it's something we need to actively do because we're constantly being tricked by that bad is stronger than good. And that redirects our attention. So at night, we just write down three good things. We write down three good yeah. things from the day. We can ask our young people, what happened today that was good? I started doing it with my five-year-old and she said to me, "Mommy." Is this normal? Do other people talk like this? <laughs> <laughs> so I think it's important to do. Young people will find it quite strange. Yeah. But after about four nights of persisting, she was volunteering good yeah, things. Yeah. So, you know, we feel silly sometimes doing this with our young people. Um, but it's really worth doing because we miss the positives yeah. and they're there. So it's a double-edged sword having psychologists or psychiatrists as parents, is it? <laughs> Eva, what, I've, what, I've what done three good things on, on a WhatsApp with my adult children. It works really, really well. I mean, I, th I think what I'm going to go for is, um, it's like pick and mix here, really, which one. But I'm going to go for trying to get a sense of autonomy and control back. Mm. So like, even if you feel really, you know, your hands are really tied and the kids are screaming at you and you're trying to work and have Zoom meetings and et cetera, et cetera. Try and figure out what can I f have some kind of sense of mastery about, you know, even if it comes down to I can choose when I can have a cup of tea or I can pick when I'm going to go for a walk or I can, you know, I can choose what clothes I'm going to wear today or just something that's going to give you a sense of mastery and control and autonomy because we are being controlled by this virus. Yes, I yeah. mean, there's no doubt about it. So, so within that, because... You know, the evidence about people who've been exposed to really severe adversity, so people who've been kidnapped or people who've been, you know, uh, say, in the Holocaust, you know, um, is the people who survived or the people who found a way of feeling in control, yeah. even within the terrible restrictions they're exposed to. 
and making meaning, having a sense of meaning, yeah. out of, uh, oh, choosing well, yeah. the choosing the response. Totally, yeah. Yeah. I, I, that's great advice. What What would your your well, takeaway be? Kieran, my, mine would be. I mean, I, I would absolutely endorse all of the that's been said. But I I think I'd like to bring people back to the unity of mind and body yes. and see how they could get a handle on that. And there are so many ways. But I suppose I'd amplify and reiterate the idea about taking care of sleep. It's a really good way that you can actually take charge of your mind. Um, and, and the opposite is true. If you lose your sleep, you can't, you can't be well. So I'd turn off the telly. I, I, I would you know, do the things we do, try to make the room comfortable. Certainly, if you're having to make an office of your bedroom, make plans to make some other way where sleep can be something that you prioritize in the room you go to sleep. And, and really make that something that you actually feel an achievement about. And then don't lie in bed saying, oh my God, I've got a busy day tomorrow. If you have to lie in the bed, lie there. You know, just make it a place you like to, to be horizontal in. I think that's, that's great advice to finish on and, and uh, a very humane advice uh, to finish on. Uh, that, that concludes our discussion for this evening. Uh, my thanks to our, our guest speakers. Uh, my sincere thanks to you. I've learned a great deal from that. Professor Eva Doherty, uh, Professor Jim Lucy and Dr. Trudy Min. The next event in the My Health series is called A Toolkit uh, for Winter Readiness and that will air on Tuesday the 13th of October. Uh, I'll be joined by uh, Professor Hilary Humphreys, uh, Dr. Fidelma Fitzpatrick and Professor Sam McConkey and we'll be discussing the winter flu season and what we should expect and how we can stay well uh, this winter. So from the RCSI My Health Season, uh, stay well. <laughs>